Hi, my name is Gina Falzen. I'm a photographer and I'm from Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Alden McDonald. I'm an actress living in Shanghai, China. I'm originally from Los Angeles, but I've been in China for almost five years now. While I've been living in Shanghai, uh, I transitioned from being a technologist to a teacher and ultimately to a photographer. We've really um, had an opportunity to meet some very influential people that have had a great impact on our lives and has helped me grow as an artist as well as a human being. Living in China, I've had many opportunities to continue my acting career. I've been in several uh, TV series. I often play the American boss or the mom. Has she told you about the features of Fire Opal? Yeah, so technically it's a collaboration, unfortunately. Savage, sit. Sit. OK, don't sit. Roll over. In 2020, the year that we're in, given the global pandemic, uh, climate crisis, election worries in the U.S., it's a strange time to be alive, uh, and it's also a strange time to be in China, to be watching it from afar. We're waiting to see what happens and just hoping for the best for our country, and watching also to see how different countries handle it, you know, especially China, um, because it's very different from the way the U.S. is handling it. It's been really eye-opening to see how different countries have reacted to the same pandemic. We started in China and we rushed home because we thought we would be safe there. When my husband came back to China, they shut the border, so we were very saddened. And we worked very, very hard and did everything that we could to get back into China. So we are so thankful to be back within China where things are safe and we're taking the correct precautions so that we can actually interact and be in society again. Having just spent eight months in the U.S. due to the pandemic, I can say that my life here is a much more dynamic in terms of the number of people I meet on a daily basis. I also feel that because of the way China's handling the pandemic, we do have a sense of freedom here that we wouldn't have in the U.S. at the moment. Uh, my daughter can go to school uh, freely. We are able to move pretty freely around the city and around the country. I definitely consider myself a foodie. I really enjoy spices, vinegars. I'm a salt and, and sour person. I am definitely a foodie. <laughs> I try to cook, but I have to admit I'm not fabulous at it, so enjoying other people's cooking is a hobby. On this trip, we'll be visiting Nanjing. We get to go to Nanjing for a full week. Nanjing is the capital of Jiangsu province in China. It covers 2,500 square miles, which is about five times bigger than the city of Los Angeles. And it has a total population of 8.4 million, which is a little bit more than New York City. Situated in the Yangtze River Delta region, Nanjing has a prominent place in Chinese history and culture, having served as the capital of various Chinese dynasties, kingdoms, and Republican governments dating from the 3rd century to 1949. My travel partner on this trip is Alden McDonald. She's a good friend and we've been friends for several years during both of our stints in China. So to describe Gina is kind of difficult to do. She is dynamic. She is tough as nails. She is wicked smart. She is incredibly funny and she is loyal. She's always got my back. She is my yin to my yang, right? <laughs> Alden is a dynamo. Alden has so much energy, she's so smart, she can figure things out right away. Uh, I find myself following her. <laughs> Even though I've been here longer and I feel like I have a lot more China experience, sometimes she cuts things down to the essence and I find myself thinking, oh yeah, she really knows what's going on. She's been a really great, a great friend and a great support.
I've been to Nanjing several times for work. I'm normally though on set or in a warehouse, so I don't really normally have the opportunity to explore the city, so I'm really looking forward to it. I've never been to Nanjing before. This is my first visit, and this really marks it off as a special place for me. And I'm looking forward to visiting some of the more artistic ventures that we have coming our way. One of my favorite features of traveling in China is the high-speed train. Nanjing is about 200 miles away from Shanghai. By high-speed rail, it took us less than an hour and a half. Gina, our first day in Nanjing. So exciting to be here. And look, another wall, just like we just had. Yes, absolutely. Let's take a look. Let's take it in. Our first adventure in Nanjing has been to the Zhonghua Men, or the Gate of China. This magnificent architectural structure was founded by the founder of the Ming Dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang, who, when he became emperor, made Nanjing the capital of China. This structure is over 600 years old. It took over 20 years to build this structure. Although they call it China Gate, it's actually four gates. While you walk in, you see massive doors that swing in, as well as huge gates that drop down from the top to the bottom. It must have been super impressive to come to this city back in the day. No one was going to penetrate these walls, that was for sure. And in the north section, there were seven staying holes for soldiers to hide out and wait for intruders. There are 27 soldier staying holes in all. This is truly a huge complex. It's a testament to the quality and the attention to detail that almost all of it remains today. Every single brick had to be approved for its quality and its content. It's been signed by the maker and numbered. And if you look around the structure, you can see writings on many of the bricks. One of the most striking features of this complex are the ramps on the sides. They're huge structures that they used to use to get the chariots and the horses and the carts all the way up to the top of this wall. As we walked through the gates, we saw many families taking advantage. I had a great time meeting lots of little children, photographing them jumping around, as well as my friend Alden jumping around. We had just a great time. a special opportunity to end our day here today at Jianyuan Garden, which is one of the five most famous gardens in southern China. Walking off the streets of the somewhat noisy, crowded areas of Nanjing and coming into this serene and peaceful Chinese garden, it really transports you to a more ancient, traditional China. Genuine Garden is the only well-preserved Ming Dynasty architectural complex in Nanjing. And with over 600 years of history, it also happens to be the oldest of its kind in the city. These gardens have several aspects that are repeated. One being the crystal clear ponds, another being the winding bridges and walkways. Uh, you can also see the colorful pavilions. and the limestone rocks that provide great shadows and imaginations for little ones who can run around and try and find dragons. I was really excited to see these mandarin ducks in one of the water pools. I think I took 300 photos of them. <laughs> they have the most peculiar body movements. And it was just thrilling to watch them chase after each other. Really, really fun to watch. Along with two black swans, which had their own movements. It's really spectacular to see these animals. The garden is divided into two sections, the outdoor garden area and the museum. And in the museum, they have many relics from the Taiping Rebellion. 
During the 1800s, the Taiping Rebellion was having success and the leaders of the rebellion occupied the park as their residence. About 100 years after the Taiping Rebellion, the park fell into some level of disrepair until 1960 when the government completely restored it and made it the beauty that it is today. And the most amazing part of this experience was the museum puts on a almost a parade or a interactive musical show for us. The entire garden was the stage for this performance. <laughs> It started at the front gate with traditional Chinese instruments. This performance contained two very skilled players of the Arhu. And Gu Zheng. Which are two traditional Chinese musical instruments. And then they got up and walked through the garden and we followed them. And it moved around the park, which made it really exciting because we got to move along with the performers and the audience sort of had to guess what was coming next. The performance was followed by a theatrical performance, similar to what you would think of as Beijing opera. The headdresses were gorgeous. And you could tell she was very controlled in every facial expression she gave. She had exact movements with the fan. And this is something I would really like to study more about. Being an actor, I have spent time on stage, but never in the opera world. So I think when I get home, this is something I'll look into more. <laughs> Then we wandered on and saw a violin performance up in the pavilion from above. And then we got to see dancers with these butterfly costumes that were just so beautiful in all their colors. You could have this sort of surround sound aspect of the performance that wouldn't have existed in a regular theater. This is something I never expected to see here in Nanjing, but I'm so glad I got to participate in. It was really spectacular and a wonderful end to our day. We started our second day here in Nanjing at the Ming Shaoling Mausoleum Scenic Area. We started this lovely autumn Sunday walking on the Sacred Way, which is the entrance way to the Ming Shaoling Mausoleum. It's over a mile long. The first section is called the Elephant Road, and it's shaded by humongous trees. The Elephant Road consists of stone structures of 12 pairs of six different kinds of animals, including elephants, lions, camels, and horses. And these are meant to guard the tomb. As a New Englander, having lived in Shanghai for so long, I don't get to experience autumn all that much anymore. And the colors were outstanding, the leaves were plentiful, and it was a joy to see families taking pictures. We then continue on the Wenzhong Road, which contains warriors and generals that are meant to guide the spirit of the mausoleum holder to the afterlife. Then we came to a grand gate. I think this gate was called the Gate of Civilians and Military. This was the mausoleum for Zhu Yuanchang. He was the founder of the Ming Dynasty. The main structure of the Mingxiao Mausoleum is 
formidable to say the least. It's very tall and very wide, constructed of white marble with the most beautiful blue and red painted architectural detail on the very top. Construction of the mausoleum began during the emperor's life in 1381, and it ended in 1405. It took over 100,000 laborers and almost 25 years to construct this grand mausoleum. The original wall of the mausoleum is more than 14 miles long. The mausoleum was built under a heavy guard of over 5,000 troops. Once we enjoyed the outside, we went inside. We actually walk through the middle of it, almost like a tunnel. And then you go through the tunnel, you go up these ramps to the sides of it, and you get up to this viewing platform. From there, it is a spectacular view. I was impressed with Zhu Yuanzhang because he came from humble beginnings. His father and his brother were both killed due to illness as well as famine. He was forced into being a monk so that he could survive by begging, and then he joined the military. He impressed his superiors who then gifted him a wife, and he found his wife to be a formidable partner and cherished her intellect, which gave him great power to create one of the greatest dynasties in Chinese history. So that to me was really striking, that he could start from such humble beginnings and end up being an emperor who was being honored by this huge mausoleum for thousands and thousands of years to come. After the Ming Shaoling tomb, we ventured over to Dr. Sun Yat-sen's mausoleum. He was the leader of the Chinese Democratic Party, which brought the Qing Dynasty to an end. It has deep historical significance, magnificent architecture, and exquisite scenery. Dr. Sun Yat-sen's mausoleum covers almost 20 acres of land. It's quite gorgeous with its blue tiled roofs. We came in and we thought we had done several stairs when we came to a little pavilion that had a stone tablet. And then we walked around and realized we had almost 400 more steps to go. <laughs> So Alden and I are regular exercise partners and we relish the opportunity to climb these stairs. We're here in Nanjing, day two, at the Ming Tomb Scenic Area. At Sun Yat-sen's mausoleum. Take a look at this scenery. You could see almost the entire city of Nanjing. as well as this great slope that went down into the fall colors. Once we took a look around, we ventured into the structure and we walked in and saw this statue that has been carved out of Italian white marble. Visiting Dr. Sun Yat-sen's mausoleum was very important to me, especially today. We just found out that America has elected Biden and Harris as our new um, president and vice president. And this is historical. It's our first female in such a high position. It's important to me to understand history, not just American history, but history all over the world. I think we can learn a lot from people like Sun Yat-sen and Zhu Yuanzhang because they bring in new ideas and new strength they may come from humble beginnings, but their perseverance really shows through. And it was a wonderful thing to see that today and to see that the people of China paying homage and climbing the wonderful stairs to this mausoleum, which we were warned about ahead of time, and they did not disappoint. <laughs> This afternoon, we had the opportunity to visit Mr. Chi Yi, 
who is a famous inscriptions rubbing artist and calligrapher. We had the opportunity to watch him do some calligraphy that he's been working on for the last 20 years. And we watched him hold the brush at the very top so he's painting in a vertical manner. I've never seen anybody do this before. I don't know how he can control his hand quite so elegantly, but the characters themselves are beautiful. It's more of an art than it is a writing. He was spontaneous, he went down a winding road, and I think as an artist it's important to be spontaneous. It's important to understand spontaneity as a means to an end versus trying to follow on to a strict plan. And at the end he took his chop out, which is the Chinese equivalent to a signature. And it's basically put into a red ink and chopped or stamped onto the page. And then he took his thumb and also put it in the ink and put that on the artwork. And he put one on the middle of the page. And we asked, why would you put this here? And he goes, because I felt like it. <laughs> I love this about art because it's instinctual, it's of the moment, it's organic, and it's beautiful. And Gina being a photographer and me being an actor, I went to art school. I really appreciate the sort of um, getting to watch someone's process and their thought about what they're doing. Mr. Chui then showed us some of his other projects. One of the collections that Chui developed was during a reconstruction phase of an ancient neighborhood in Nanjing. And what he did was he took specific motifs of buildings and nature in the villages and he rubbed them with ink and then cut them out, ripped them out, ripped the piece of paper out and plastered them on black paper in order to show them out in relief. And then he also showed us one that he had done of a piece of bark, a piece of wood. And obviously this is very old and this piece of wood will not survive most likely, but his rubbing will. And so I almost think of him not only just as an artist, but also as an archeologist and a historian, someone who will allow my children to experience something maybe they can't see any longer, but there is now a dream or a thought of these things that are now lost to us. The second piece that he showed us was a gigantic rubbing of a tree section, which is, looks to be about four meters square rubbing. It's just the most beautiful stump of a tree. You can see each of the rings pretty clearly. It must take a large amount of patience. When you cut a tree on the trunk, there are rings around. And however many rings is how many years old that tree is. And he tells us, and I trust him because I didn't count it myself, that there were 700 rings. Imagine counting 700 rings, let alone blotting 700 rings with this ink. This was a labor of love, obviously, and it's a beautiful piece of art. Our day today was all about history and progress and people. And it really hit home to me today, of course, because it's November and I'm watching my country go through changes and growth and progress. And I hope that this new beginning will bring a better relationship between China and America. Today we had a wonderful day exploring traditional arts in Nanjing. Our first stop was at Master Zhao's studio in the Nanjing Folk Museum. Master Zhao is a Ronghua master of art. Ronghua is the art of making velvet flower. <laughs> And Master Zhao led us in to his studio to teach us more about Ronghua. This craft is very ancient. It dates back all the way to the Tang Dynasty, which is somewhere around 600 through 900 AD. 
Back then, these art pieces were worn in the hair and as well as pins on clothing, and it was reserved only for the imperial family and for three holidays and one event. Those holidays are Chunjie, which is spring festival, mid-autumn festival, and dragon boat festival. And the one event, of course, is your wedding. Master Zhao is the remaining heir of this intangible cultural artifact in Jiangsu province. It'll take Master Zhao about two or three days to create a flower that is about four inches in diameter. Just by using pliers and his own steady hand, he's able to make so many things with Ronghua, including flowers, pandas, farm scenes, etc. Master Zhao taught us from start to finish how this process works. For one, they dye their own silk, which is absolutely beautiful in all kinds of colors. He takes two thin pieces of wire, one on top and one on the bottom, and sandwiches that silk together. At that point, he needs to use special, very sharp scissors to hedge along and trim the object into what's going to be the components of his final art form. And then he twists the remaining fibers that are trapped within this brass strings together, almost in like a pipe cleaner type structure, and it creates like a caterpillar type of object. You can barely feel it. And then he puts several of those together, like petals or leaves. And then he takes another strand of silk and wraps that around there very tight to keep it together. Then in our instance, he took a pin, a hat pin, put it in the middle and wrapped that around with the silk so that the stems all came together with a pin. He cut off the excess. He folded very gently with those tweezers the shape and the style of the leaf that he was trying to create. And then he folded that over so that it, when it's on the actual clothing, it goes the right direction. And truly, it looks so organic. Some of Pyalian. It looks very natural, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Gina and I were really lucky to get a lesson from Mr. Zhao ourselves. We got to pick out the color that we wanted to work with. We got to take the tweezers and fold them over and experience how difficult it actually is to twist those pieces together. It was actually more delicate and complex than it actually looked. You have one hand doing one thing, and the other hand has to be simultaneously turning in a different direction. So it really requires an ambidextrous approach, which is something that I think would need many thousands of hours to perfect. You have to have great hand control as well as patience. As you put it together, I'm hoping if a little practice, I might get better at it, because Mr. Zhao thought I had some potential. This afternoon we continued our exploration into Nanjing traditional art forms by visiting Gu Ye Liang. Gu Ye Liang is a traditional lantern artist. The art of lantern making here in China is very important. It's used for our spring festival. If you've been to China during that time, you'll understand what I'm talking about. There are lanterns everywhere that light up and make everyone so happy during the holiday festivals. The lantern festival is over 1700 years old. During the Ming Dynasty, the Emperor Zhu Yuan Zhang held grand lantern festivals every year that lasted almost 10 days. Master Gu's studio was in his home and was jam-packed with so many different examples of his work, 
many of which were lit up. As a photographer, this was a visual feast for me. Uh, I really enjoyed watching and looking at some of these interactive displays, and especially this one dragon that was along the wall that literally had every single color displayed at a certain different time. The most popular lanterns are the ones that symbolize the animals from the Chinese zodiac. But he also tells us his most popular is the lotus lantern because that symbolizes luck and success. We were so excited to watch this being made because this is the one that Nanjing is famous for. Master Gu is world renowned. He's traveled to over 52 countries around the world, showing his art, promoting his art, and also selling it. He started learning about this art form at the age of eight, being introduced to it by his father. By the time he was 18 years old, he began his professional career. He was so kind in showing us several of the 62 steps that it takes to make a lotus lantern. The first of the steps was carving the bamboo in order to make what's called the bones of the structure. I was surprised to see that he doesn't use any metal staples or nails to create these forms. He actually uses a tissue that he twists very, very finely, and then he applies a glue to that and wraps it around where that bamboo structure comes together at a joint. Making the lotus flower was absolutely ingenious to me. The lotus flower petals themselves were rectangular pieces of pre-dyed and pre-cut paper. And in order to create the ridges and the structure, this wooden tool was used and copper wire, taking a stack of maybe a dozen or so of the pieces of paper and wrapping them around a, a large wooden dowel. He very patiently and with great restraint took the copper wire and he wrapped it around the wooden dowel that was coated with the paper in a very even fashion, very slowly, very zen, until it was tight enough that he could then take the wooden dowel and put it inside a circular container which then crushed the paper. Oh, so smart. Therefore, solidifying the lines of the lotus flower petals. And then he separated each of the petals, the, the stack of petals, by blowing on them. <laughs> and then he took each petal and he wrapped the end of it with another piece of copper wire and then that actually created the tip of the petal. And then he took the base of the lantern and glued all the petals on one by one, layer by layer. Puts one on each joint first. And thus, we had a beautiful lantern. Just like a lotus flower. Mr. Gu told us that his son is also interested in this art. He takes it up as a hobby. And now his son just had his son, so he's a grandfather. Maybe this grandson will also follow in their footsteps and continue on with the lantern making. We spent this morning in the beautiful old part of Nanjing at the Futsimiao. It's also known as the Confucius Temple. Although Confucianism isn't exactly a religion, they do refer to this as the Confucius Temple because it's where people come to honor and respect the scholar and philosopher Confucius. Confucius lived around 500 BCE. He's credited with authoring a number of texts that dictated societal and cultural norms most of which today are known as Confucianism. Confucius has probably had the largest influence on what we know today of as Chinese traditional thinking and mindset. The original temple was built in the Song Dynasty, 
However, during the Japanese occupation, it was burnt down. It was rebuilt in the 1980s with help from the government funding. They are places where you can burn incense and also buy little wood carts. Today we bought one, Gina and I, and we wrote our name on it with a wish of our friendship lasting a long lifetime. The area that we entered was the exam area, and there were a series of booths where people would sit and take their exams and do their studying. And by people, I mean men. <laughs> At the time, education was primarily, almost exclusively for males, young and old. The examinations were quite hard, but it did allow people who were from the lower wealth patterns to join government and join the higher levels of society. Confucius believed that education would help people prosper and help governance prosper as well. One of my favorite Confucianism rules is, what you do not wish for yourself, do not do to others. It sounds very similar to our own golden rule, which says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. One of the nicest things that we got to do this morning was ride on a boat through the Qinhuai River, which goes through and past the Confucius Temple here in Nanjing. The architectural designs are uh, reminiscent of an Anhui structure, which is uh, a lot of white buildings with beautiful geometric patterns along windows and other areas of the buildings. We went under multiple bridges that had engraved sides and carvings. There were lots of bridges that we sailed under and beautiful riverbanks, which I mentioned to Alden, how could they have built all this? It's just beautiful bricks that surround the banks of the river, as well as some of them are new, some of them are old, just a very beautiful structure. As a photographer and an artist, I love to see symmetry and art as part of daily life, and this definitely became uh, apparent on our boat ride today. So it's really enjoyable to see that. After our fun boat ride on the river, Gina and I got to come over to the Yunjin Brocade Museum. Yunjin literally means cloud brocade because it's as beautiful as the clouds in the sky. It was developed during the Song Dynasty and is considered one of China's most exquisite traditional art forms. In 2009, Nanjing Brocade was inscribed on the UNESCO Intangible Heritage List. Here we walked through and saw multiple examples of a weft brocade that is traditional here in China. It's a beautiful brocade that uses its weft threads in a different way than I've ever seen before. The master and the heir of this art form, whom we had the honor of visiting today, is named Zhou Shuangxi and he's been applying himself to this art form for 48 years. Zhou Shuangxi is proud of Nanjing's Yunjing brocade history of 1,500 years, and the patterns produced on the wooden looms showcase the 4,700 years of China's silk textile history. And in China's 3,000-year history of brocade production, Nanjing Yunjing brocade is the only kind that cannot be duplicated by machines. Its traditional pattern weaving technology has always been passed down by the memory of, the, of its masters. It is truly an outstanding representative of the exquisite traditional culture of China. The unique part about Yunjing Brocade is it's created on a loom that is 13 feet tall and takes two operators to make work. We had the opportunity to watch him work with his partner of over 40 years. Master Joe was in charge of applying the color to the fabric.
and his partner was in charge of actually building the fabric's pattern, which was done with a series of levers and his handwork. We also watched as he wove in actual pieces of gold thread. And then he would push it down, tighten it. And then he would operate part of the loom with his foot. These foot pedals were bamboo, as well as some of the weights that were holding the threads. It looked like a very ancient loom that I had never seen before. It takes about a full day to weave two inches of fabric. After Mr. Joe's demonstration, we walked through another part of the museum which had multiple robes on display. One of the great things that we saw were these imperial robes for the royal families of the Song and Tang dynasties. The robes are magnificent. I was definitely struck by the multiple colors and the layers that these people would carry around. It must have been extremely heavy. In ancient times, this type of brocade was only used in the imperial courts for the emperors. And nowadays, people can use it in their everyday lives. We started today with a trip out to the Nanjing Gold Thread and Gold Leaf Factory. A little bit about the process of creating gold leaf. We learned that gold is first melted down. It's poured into slits and then that's cut to make it even smaller. The gold is pounded down till it's about aluminum foil type thickness. It's cut into many pieces, about half inch by half inch squares. And each of these squares is called a twist. Then we take each twist and they're placed exactly in the center of more black, thin, fine paper. This paper is very slippery. It's flexible so that the pressure that's about to be applied to it can get to the gold but won't destroy the actual paper. Then it is folded up into little packets with paper around it about three times. Those packets are taken then to the pounding room where one operator will put it on the pedestal while the machine will drive pressure down onto this. He moves it around so that the pressure is applied evenly throughout. The room is deafening. But it is quite nice to have a foot massage while it's going on. It's shaking and the guys have their earplugs in and I'm totally worried the whole time that their hands might get in there. But they're very skilled at what they do. Gold leaf was invented to give sculptures, in particular Buddhist sculptures, a regal sense. But it's also been used for decoration of furniture, clothing, and even food. This craft has remained virtually unchanged for hundreds of years, and it can only be done by hand. Nanjing currently produces about 60% of the world's gold leaf. One other aspect we saw of gold foil today was once they took it off the black paper, they stacked it up in piles. It looked like leaves in autumn. We couldn't understand why this wasn't being processed the same as that. It turns out this pile of leaves are actually gonna be crushed up and made into a powder. This powder can be used in paints and resins, and it can be used to apply to clothing as well as furniture, paints, and other. And now it's time for the cutting. This is the last phase before the product goes to market. The person doing the cutting uses a bamboo square knife and stamp cut it onto that pad, and then again, using their breath, 
and bamboo or goose feather transfer it to its final paper storage, which is then stacked on top and created package for the market. But what we really came for was to see how the gold thread is made. This is when we met Mr. and Mrs. Wong. They are the last heirs of this amazing traditional craft. Mr. Wong is the cutter. And Ms. Wong is the thread spinner. The first thing that we actually got to see was Mrs. Wong spin these very, very fine pieces of gold along with yellow cotton thread into actually spun fabric. In front of Mrs. Wong is a spindle hanging from above. It has cotton thread already on it. She takes this spindle with the cotton thread on it. She takes a piece of the strand of gold, wraps it gently to the, the cotton thread itself. Then she pulls it down and rolls it across her thigh so that it spins while she holds the gold and it spins all the way up this thread. We also got to watch Mr. Wong cut these gold threads. He stacks these papers up to about 40 pieces. He secures them with cardboard and nails so they won't move around during the cutting process. Then he places them into the cutter and rolls it in. And again, he told us, be careful, it's going to be loud. Nobody understood because it didn't sound so loud and all of a sudden, bam! And the cutter comes down and it makes this very, very thin strand of gold. Again, this is something that was traditionally done by hand and is now done by machine. Uh, it still requires a tremendous amount of attention and skill and precision. It has different colors in it. Yeah, it does seem in the sunlight it looks like different colors, but maybe it's just the back. After seeing these gold threads being used in the brocade and what magnificent, luxurious items they can make, I truly hope that the Wongs can find an apprentice to follow in their footsteps and keep this traditional art alive. We've eaten so well in Nanjing that it's hard to top what we've done so far. That managed to happen this afternoon at the Nanjing Da Pai Dang restaurant. Nanjing Da Pai Dang, which literally means Nanjing street food. Mr. Zhao decided about 30 years ago that he would collect the recipes of all the street foods that he treasured so much in his city of Nanjing. He created this restaurant to give the people and the city a place to eat these foods in a hygiene and serene setting. We met with the charming Mr. Zhao, who is the founder of Da Pai Dong, which is a restaurant here in Nanjing. It was built about five years ago, and it's just one of his 80 shops across the world in 16 different countries, including Singapore. Walking into Da Pai Dong is like walking into a movie set. The ambience was really well attended to. And it's like a courtyard. And there are all these food stalls with windows so that you can see the chefs actually preparing the food that you're going to have. They have over a hundred different dishes at a time and they rotate them year after year. About 20 get changed. We had a really nice time talking with Mr. Zhao. He introduced us to a number of different of his favorite foods. It's very salty, but that brings out the duck taste to it. That's very lovely. I love this. Mm. It's also very tender. I think it's been soaked for or brined for one or two days to get this level of saltiness and so also surrounded by a pretty thick layer of um, duck fat, it really makes for a very nice texture. Mm, delicious. 
So this is a clear noodle, a glass noodle with uh, duck blood and some tofu and cilantro. I've had duck blood before. It's a very popular ingredient in suan la tang, which is hot and sour soup. This dish, as well as the duck we had before, are the two most common dishes in Nanjing. This is what we refer to as a pot sticker. Inside you'll find meat, um, vegetables, and chestnut that give it a little extra crunch on the inside. Mm -hmm. I think this is my favorite so far. How true. How true. It seems like a real family type of place and I can't wait to bring my kids back. They'll find all these decorations super fun. Well, today is our last day in Nanjing, and we spent it visiting two very important structures in the city, the first of which is the Jiming Temple. Jiming Temple means crowing rooster, so what better way to start our morning than there? The temple is set in a very hilly area and thus has many, many stairs. We had a nice time climbing through the stairs and looking at the foliage and the designs of the buildings. It seemed a little bit less flat than some of the other temples that I visited in China, and a lot more dimension to it. The Jiming Temple is one of the oldest and most renowned Buddhist temples in Nanjing. The temple was originally constructed in 527, and it's been destroyed and reconstructed a number of times since. The temple that exists today was built in 1387 during the Ming Dynasty. It was yet again destroyed during the Taiping Rebellion and has been restored since to what you see today. When we first entered the temple, we entered the room that had the Happy Buddha in it. That harkens back to the factory tour that we did yesterday and got to see all that gold leaf, so I was glad to see it being used. After that, we went up some more stairs to the mid-level. There was a window, a stall, where we could buy little cards that we could write down our own wishes. So Gina and I got some and we wrote down what we wished for this year and we hung it up in the rafters. For 2020, I am just wishing for our world to recover from COVID, to find love for all of our differences, and hopefully to find peace between our people. After that, we climbed more stairs to the top floor. There, I used my jaw sticks that I got at the very beginning at the entrance gate. They're given to you as part of your entrance fee. You get three, and these signify Buddha, his teachings, and the monastery. What you should do is take these incense sticks over to the offering where they have burning candles. Light them on fire, but you don't keep them on fire. You want the smoke to protrude. Come out with the sticks back out to the courtyard. Hold them between your palms pointing to each other and bring them up to your face. And you should bow towards the Buddha three times. And then you turn to the west and bow three times this way. Turn to the south, bow three times. Turn to the east, bow three times. Incense and bowing is supposed to clear your head, clear your space. And the grounding effect of bowing in each direction can really center you. I felt much better after this. The crown of this temple is the seven-story pagoda that overlooks the entire temple. It's absolutely gorgeous in its yellow-gold color. One of the traditions in Buddhism is they like to circle in a clockwise manner. This is to represent that you are putting religion in the middle of your life. It's to center you and remind you that that is the most important thing. I'm thinking to myself of this fantastic trip that I've had and soon I have to return home. So I really needed this centering practice. I'm a little sad because today is our last day here in Nanjing and it's wrapping up our trip. But we thought one of the best ways to culminate our adventure is here at Chaotian Palace.
The Chow Tian Palace is the largest scale, highest grade, and best preserved architectural complex in southern China. And it occupies about 10 acres. The history of this palace dates back over 2,500 years. Chow Tian literally means worship of the gods. This place has been used for many things, including a Taoist temple, a Buddhist temple. In 1886, this temple was converted into yet another purpose, a Confucius temple. This palace is now also the site of the Nanjing Municipal Museum. Walking into this vast complex, I was really hit with the vast expansiveness of the place. The red walls were painted in a rich, sort of almost auburn color, topped by brilliant yellow tiles, which signify regality. The buildings here are highly decorated in carved wood autumn colors and they all blend together. It feels just perfect. Some of the highlights here in Nanjing have been learning about the traditional handcrafts. I really, really learned so much at the Yunjin Brocade Factory. I can't wait to go home and talk to some of my co-workers and see what they think about this 13-foot loom. I loved seeing the traditional art craft. The brocade process was really beautiful to me. I love great detail. I love watching detailed art get made. I love watching craftsmen work. And I think for me personally, Nanjing reminds me a lot of home. It reminds me a lot of Boston in that it's a bit of a smaller city. It has winding roads, it's a little bit hilly, but it's still noisy and, and bustling. And that to me is home. And so I think that Nanjing exceeded my expectations for sure. I really hope that Americans can somehow travel again soon and experience the things that we have recently. I really enjoy the architecture. This trip has really inspired me and reminded me that we can get through this together. We will get back to normalcy and we'll get back to happiness and travel if we work together.